Okay, good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to attend this webinar. Um, we are pleased to have you uh, to attend our webinar for instructions on how to submit an electronic renewal application for a third year. We want to let everyone know that you have been muted upon entry of the webinar because we will be recording it to place on our website as a reference guide for, for all renewing participants. Um, you will also be able to ask any questions in the chat box on the right-hand uh, box uh, on your screen, and we will answer the questions at the end of the webinar. Um, we hosted two additional webinars last week. Like I mentioned earlier, we will be posting the recordings and the PowerPoints um, on our website, and we will be also emailing them to everyone. Uh, now I'm going to turn the time over to Anna Rossetti for our presentation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anna Rossetti. I'm the Section Manager for Workforce for the Arizona Department of Health Services Bureau of Women's and Children's Health. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar. We're going to cover the State Loan Payment Program Electronic Application System. So our target audience for today's webinar um, are State Loan Repayment Program participants, whose initial contracts are ending between April 1 of 2019 and March 31 of 2020. For our policy, all of these participants that are renewing for year three can apply during an open renewal period, which will begin on March 1 of this year through April 1 of 2019. So this is the only time that you will be able to submit a year three renewal application. This year, we are not going to accept any paper applications because we are fully electronic with our application system. So we are requiring everyone who's renewing for year three to apply through the state loan repayment program portal. Some of the important notes I want to mention today is that your service sites have to be registered in the state loan repayment program portal before providers can apply or reapply. So right now, our site registration cycle is open, and it's open until February 28th of 2019. So please make sure to check with your site administrators to confirm that your, your site has registered. You can also email us, and we can confirm if your site has registered. Again, this is very important because if your sites have not registered, you're not going to be able to see that site in a drop-down menu for you to be able to submit your application online. So make sure that you do this before you, um, you access the portal, make, making sure that your site administrators have confirmed that your site is in fact registered in our portal. So last year we launched this electronic system. We initially launched, launched the, the electronic application for new providers. Uh, submitting their initial application in the portal. And what's improved, as you know, you all have gone through the paper-based application system. That's a, a, a real outdated system. Um, it's, it's very cumbersome, if you recall. Um, our electronic system, our, our goal is to make the application process a paperless process. Providers, last um, two years ago when you had applied uh, for your initial application to the state loan payment program, you all recall that you have you were responsible to submit site specific documents from the employer and those documents are the sliding fee scale table the policy the signage evidence of the hipsa so for this particular um, this uh, electronic system submission you are not going to be responsible for those documents anymore that's the reason why sites have to register in a portal and part of their registration process is to submit all of the relevant documentation for this site. Um, so you're not going to be able to, or you're not required to actually submit these documents as part of your application. Incomplete applications due to missing or incorrect, incorrect site-specific documents were actually very um, common uh, when we were operating the paper-based system. And our goal is to eliminate or minimize incomplete applications. And also, our electronic system is designed to screen ineligible applicants. Obviously, you all are year three applica applicants, and hopefully you will continue to be eligible for the program um, and uh, be able to submit successfully in our portal. 
So this is just to emphasize who can apply for the for the state loan repayment program. There's not been a change to our eligibility requirements in terms of specific provider types. Um, for those of you who applied in 2016, or I'm sorry, 2017, and your contracts are obviously near expiring, um, you know that our program had expanded in 2015, and as a result, we added um, specific types of providers such as mental health providers, pharmacists, um, we have geriatric physicians and psychiatrists. Um, there's not been a change to our eligibility um, provider types, um, so if you have, uh, you know, friends or uh, co-workers who are interested to apply, please uh, make sure to let them know that um, they can apply during an open application cycle. And our new provider application cycle is going to open in April of this year. Um, these are just uh, additional eligibility requirements for providers. Uh, you, of course, have already met this requirement being that you're current participants of the program, but again, I want to emphasize that you have to have a prospect or a current employment, uh, either full-time or half-time status at an eligible site, providing outpatient primary care services. With our expansion, we were able to allow inpatient services only. If you're a, a provider working in a critical access hospital, you can apply or continue to qualify for the state loan payment program if you're working in a critical access hospital in conjunction with uh, providing outpatient services at the hospital-affiliated rural health clinic. And of course, in order to qualify for year three for all of those who are renewing, you have to have qualifying loans that are still owed and you cannot have any current um, other than the state loan payment program obligation or unsatisfied obligation with any entity. So for site eligibility requirements, um, hopefully you all stayed with approved site. If you're no longer or you're planning to transfer to another site, make sure that your site for the purpose of year three renewal is uh, eligible and the eligible requirements are on your screen. It's um, ha Sites have to be public or private nonprofit or rural private practice sites. Your sites have to be located in a HIPAA specific to your discipline. For pharmacists, uh, pharmacists have to meet a, a primary care HIPAA. Uh, for rural private practice sites, um, you have to be in a rural area, and if your site is not a HIPAA, you have to meet the state HIPAA, de uh, the state um, designation of an Arizona medically underserved area, have to have assignment with access, Medicare, and a qualifying health plan um, available in your area, and also uh, implement a sliding fee scale, except, of course, if your site is a free clinic or a state prison. So what your responsibilities are um, is to understand pro our program requirements in the online application system. There is a provider reference guide that's available online that you can find on that link. I know that's really hard, but if you have a copy of the webinar materials, you'll be able to click on this link and you can get access to this um, PDF document. This is also, this also lives on our website under the Apply for Repayment tab. Just scroll down and you will see this guide on there. Complete your application online, including up uploading all supporting documents that are required and also follow up with your site administrator, which is very, very, very important. I can't emphasize this enough about your application. Um, your, part of the process for site administrators is to verify your employment with them and also provide additional eligibility verification. So there are two things that I'm asking you all to do. One is to follow up with your site administrator to make sure that their site, the site that you're in is registered in our portal. And then second, once you, um, you initiate your application in the portal, you will be able to um, you, you'll see that the site administrator has, on the, uh, uh, which I will also cover later on, is that the status is pending in terms of the employment verification process. And what you're going to do is to follow up with your site administrator to make sure that they complete the provider or the employment verification process. Not until then can you actually submit your application uh, fully in the portal. So I'm going to go ahead and do the step-by-step -step instruction on how to navigate the portal. So what I would like you to do is to approach the portal as if you are going to 
Um, actually, go back to the PowerPoint. First. Okay. Um, what I'd like you to do is to approach the portal as if you're a new applicant to the portal. I know that you have all submitted your paper application, you all have submitted your supporting documentation, and we have them in paper copies. We have a physical file of everything that you've submitted. However, in order for you to be, to be uh, included in your electronic system, um, we need to capture your information on there as well as all of the documents that you will be providing at this time. So you're going to approach the portal as if you're an applicant to the, to the state loan payment program for the first time. Okay, so, um, so the login, the URL is provided here on the screen. It, this is also, the link is also on our website under the uh, apply for a payment tab. If you scroll down on that page, you will see a click here button. That is where you click to log into the portal. Once you log into the portal, you will see this page, and of course you don't have an account in the system, you're gonna to have to create an account. So click on the button, uh, no account, create one. Once you're there, um, then it will bring you to this page, and because the portal is used by both the site administrators and the obligated providers, you obviously have to identify yourself, and here you'll click obligated provider. Once you click on that, it will be, this, this screen will be um, displayed and where you're going to enter your first name, your last name, your phone number and your email, and then create your password, and then register. Once you click register, there's an email notification that gets generated to your email account. You'll have to retrieve that email. And that email is, is a direct link to the portal which you're going to click. Um, and then it will bring you to this screen again where you're gonna type in your email address that you just provided as well as the password. And then once you click log in, you'll be brought to this landing page. So the landing page, as you can see, um, there's different things that you can do when you get to the landing page because this is the page that everyone sees, whether you're a new applicant to the program, whether you're a renewing applicant, or whether you're a, an applicant who's reapplying, maybe you have not you were denied last time and you were applying. So this is the landing page that everyone sees. Now click on, so I wanna, I wanna um, show you where you're going to find the, um, so you can see on the middle of the screen, um, you'll see all of the initiated applications. So once you hit the renewal application and initiated your application, and let's just say you have to leave, you didn't finish your, your application, you saved it, you're going to see any initiated application in the middle of the screen where you, you, where you can um, view the pending applications. And then if, for example, you were successful in completing your application and submitting it, then you will see that application on the bottom of the screen. So if you, when you click renewal application, then you will be asked to enter your renewal application code. So in the middle of February, you will be sent um, Ashley and I will send you your renewal application code, and that is the code that you're going to enter on here. So if you do not, uh, we're thinking about mid-February, please, please check with us or confirm um, with us if you didn't receive anything because we're, we're thinking mid-February we'll be able to send everything, our, our, the, the code to everybody. So if you don't get it, please check your junk mail as well or spam spam mail because sometimes ADHS mail go to your spam or junk mail, so make sure you check them, check, check it first there, and if you don't see it, then um, follow up with us. Once you enter your renewal application code here, click continue, and then it will, you will be then brought to the provider application screen, which before I go there, I wanna cover uh, what sections you need to complete um, as part of your provider application. So there are nine sections that you need to complete. Um, the first section is uh, related to your personal and discipline information, then it goes to the education license information, um, and then your past and present commitment, service to underserved, your qualifying loans, which is uh, obviously this, you need to update your qualifying loan section because um, 
because what we're trying to find is whether or not you're trying to qualify your existing loans because maybe you still have balances on those loans or also and or adding new loans. So you're going to update uh, Section 5 as accurately as possible. Employer, uh, employer service site information and all of the supporting documents um, will have to be uploaded in the upload section and then there's a section on certification and then the final section is the checklist verification, which basically allows you to go through uh, all the supporting documents, check the boxes, and make sure that you've actually uploaded everything. Documents to prepare. It's important that you have the documents ready to, for upload so that you'll have a more seamless uh, application process. So the required documentation, we're going to require, well, Substitute W94, you've already submitted this um, two years ago when you applied for your initial application. If your address has changed since the last time you submitted an application to ADHS that we did not capture anywhere in, your, in any of your contract amendments, then you are required to submit a new Substitute W9 form. Um, copy of the registration confirmation email from the Arizona Procurement Portal. So this is a new system. If you recall, we had Procure AD um, last time when you applied for your initial application. Our system has changed. It's now Arizona Procurement Portal. Um, I'm going to show you later on um, what it looks like so that you'll have, um, you, you familiarize yourself with, with what it is. Um, hopefully, what we were told is that all vendors who were registered in Procure AZ, their information should have transferred over to this new system, which is the Arizona Procurement Portal. Um, you should have received an email asking you to either create an account in APP or update your account in APP. If you didn't do that, please make sure you do that before you initiate your application. So what, the, the importance of the APP registration is that this is the information, anything that you enter in this portal is the information we use, for example, when we're mailing your tax forms, because of course your funding, the funding that you get from SLURP it, are tax exempt. So we will mail your tax form in the address that you entered in the APP. Um, we also, any correspondence that we have to do, uh, we use the address that you listed in the APP, and also when we're creating your contract or, re or your renewal contract, we will use your information um, that you entered in APP. So make sure that you have an updated information there. Um, and if you have issues, there's a help um, desk that you can call uh, and ask for guidance. So birth certificate, U.S. passport, you all submitted this last time. Again, we, were, we are asking you to submit everything as if you're um, submitting for the first time or applying for the first time in the state loan repayment program. Um, and then all the other um, necessary documents are listed here. Um, on item 10, I want to be more specific in terms of what we're requiring for the, full, for the contract. Um, if you submitted your contract before and um, in your contract, let's say your current contract, um, you're submitting your current contract for the purpose of the SLURP renewal, your contract has to include specific things, and those are the things that by policy we need to check. One of them is your full-time or your half-time hours, depending on the, your um, service hour participation, if you're a full-time participant to the program and qualifying for that for year three, then your contract has to state that you're a full-time employee working at least 40 hours per week. If you're a half-time participant and you want to apply for a, a continue with a half-time um, status, then your contract has to state half-time at least 20 hours per week. Um, your start date has to be in your contract, and the name and address of, site, of your site has to be in the contract. So check your contract. Make sure that all of these elements are there. If they're not in your contract, we will ask for an amendment. In lieu of the contract, you may request or submit an employment letter, and the employment letter has to be on your company's letterhead, has to have specific information that I just mentioned and also, it has to have a contact person 
of the person, um, the designee for the employer if it's not the CEO. Um, you have to submit a copy of your most recent billing statement for each qualifying loan. So for example, if you have existing approved loans, let's say you have um, Navient and you also qualified Great Lakes, and you're going to qualify those same loans, we will ask for the most recent billing statement for those loans. Um, documentation from the lender that the loans were used solely for education or reasonable living expenses and types of documents you can submit are disbursement reports, national student loan database aid summary report, and other documentation. So this that we're not asking for a written letter from the lender, we're asking for any type of documentation that indicates that you were attending school when those loans were dis dispersed to you. If your loans were consolidated since the time that we approved those loans, and if they're not captured in a contract amendment, then those loans, um, consolidated loans, have to have um, itemized, itemized breakdown of the consolidated loans that show all of the loans that were consolidated, and all of those loans have to only be educational loans, your educational loans. So make sure that if your loans were consolidated, submit a supporting document that shows the itemized breakdown of the consolidated loans. Some additional documents that we will require, um, you, will, you will be scored, um, your, your application will be scored against others, and one of the things that we score you on is, is your residency, proof of residency. So if you have been residing in Arizona for the past 12 months, um, then you're going to show evidence of that. I will cover um, in more details what that means. And then evidence of service to the medically underserved area it does not really, it's not needed for this particular application because you're a renewing applicant. Um, so you can, you're not, you're not necessarily required to submit any evidence of service to the medically underserved area, even though you can report your experience to serving the medically underserved area in this section of the application. Okay, so I'm going to, before I cover this, I'm going to um, show you the step-by-step -step, um, uh, guide for the provider for submitting your, your application in the portal. So this is the landing page. So if you click on the renewal application, um, then you can, of course, get started with your with your application, but I created one just for just for the purpose of this demo. So because I've already created one, then I see it here as a pending application. All I need to do is to resume my application, and then it will, the first section is the personal and discipline section of the application. So all of the tabs that I mentioned earlier, the different sections, you can find on the top um, uh, at the top of the screen, these are all the sections that you're going to, going to have to navigate through. Um, here, the, under personal discipline information is basically, you, can, you, you if you recall the paper-based application, it's, it's exactly this, uh, this application, except that now you're filling, them, uh, filling the, the sections or the fields electronically. So make sure that when you're filling out um, each section of the uh, application, you're, you're uh, filling them out as completely and as accurately as possible. So I'm going to save and continue. And then the second section is your education and license information. This is the section where it captures your undergraduate information, your graduate information, maybe postgraduate if applicable, and then your licensing information, okay? Um, Again, all of the fields are already pre-filled pre for the purpose of this demo, but um, I just want to make sure that you understand that if you, there are certain fields here that are required, and so pay attention to flags, they will be in red font. If, um, if, if you leave certain required fields blank, it will give you a flag it, where you can't continue until you provide your information on those fields, so make sure Again, they're, they're, they will be in red font, so make sure you pay attention to those. Save and continue. This is a page where it asks you for your commitments, uh, past and present. So any 
anytime you answer yes to any of these questions will we'll render you ineligible for the program. So th these are federal requirements. You cannot have any, you know, any defaults or delinquency in any of your uh, service commitments or financial commitments. So, for example, if I answer yes to this question on tax liability, it will flag you that you're not eligible to apply for the program. So not, not that I'm encouraging you to say no to any of this. You have to be truthful, obviously, with your responses, but I'm just letting you know and being upfront with that information in that if you defaulted on any of these things or had um, delinquencies on your taxes, you will not be el eligible for the program. I'll okay, so now this is the uh, section where you're going to uh, indicate your service or your experience in serving the medically underserved. Um, if you were a new applicant to the program, you will be scored on, on this. Um, your, the number of experience that you've had serving the medically underserved, but because you're not a new applicant, you can simply fill out the information here and move on. So again, the, the sections are already pre-filled, so I'm going to save and continue. Okay, so this is the qualifying loan section, and basically this is a section where you're going to tell us who your lenders are, and the, the loan details for each of those lenders. So for example, you only have one lender, and let's just say it's Fed Loan Servicing. You provide your, the current servicer's name, the loan account infer, number, the purpose of the loans cannot be, can, can be education, for educational purposes only, sorry. Uh, your lender phone number, the payment address, so a lot of our providers still provide the address, the general mailing address, and not the payment address, and then we have to go back to them and say, hey, can you give me the payment address, please? So whatever payment address you enter here is the information that you're, we're going to need or we're going to uh, include in your contract. If you provide us with a general mailing address um, and we didn't capture that when we were developing the contract, then chances are your payment will go to that general mailing address and chances are it's going to be lost somewhere and there's going to be delay in posing that payment to your account. So make sure that the payment address is provided in this field. Um, and then the city, state, zip code, original lender, maybe the original lender is, I don't know, um, U.S. Department of Education, I'm just making that up, the total balance of your loan and then as of today, or yeah. And then the percentage of quarterly loan repayment disbursement, this is um, something that you're going to tell us how we're going to pay this lender, what percentage of your quarterly disbursement is allocated to this lender. So if this is the only lender that you have, then you can of course assign 100% of your quarterly loan disbursement to this lender. But if, you're, if you have say three lenders, then you're going to add a loan servicer to here and then say another loan servicer. So you have three lenders you want to qualify. Let's just say Fed Loan, Navient, um, and then your third servicer would say, um, I don't know, a private loan of uh, Wells Fargo or something. Then you're, you can assign your quarterly disbursement in a way that totals 100%. So this could be maybe your Fed Loan account has the highest interest rate, maybe that has a 6.8% interest rate and you want to tackle that first and you want to say, okay, well, 50% of my quarterly disbursement goes to this account and then maybe 25, 25 to the other two lenders. So you can assign whatever percentage of funding to each of those lenders that you're reporting on this section. Now, every time you report a lender, so for example, Fed Loan Servicing, you have to tell us the details of those loans. So without, if you don't, if you leave this blank, right now, so when you, when you get to the screen, the loan details will just be hiding, hiding in the, you know, on the bottom of the uh, loan servicer um, uh, section. So you have to click the down, downward arrow to display the actual field. And then you're going to tell us the different, the details of those loans. So for example, on this one, 
let's say you have two accounts within said loan and let's say you have direct subsidized loan uh, and then you have direct unsubsidized loan, you're going to then provide a loan type of direct subsidized and then you can add, click here to add another loan type and then that's where you're, you'll enter direct unsubsidized. So that's how you're going to uh, fill out this section. I know a lot of the providers were confused last time, so we want to make sure that, you know, you're, uh, you're clear on how to fill out this page because it's not going to let you continue unless you provide a specific information about your loan. So again, I want to emphasize if you're reporting a lender, you have to provide us the loan details, and if there's five accounts in that loan, in that loan, that you're trying to qualify, then you're going to have to um, provide five different loan details. For the purpose of this demo, obviously, um, I added Loan Servicer 2. I'm not going to fill out this information in Loan Servicer 3. Uh, three. Um, you can delete it um, anytime. If you, if you, for example, click on that button and you didn't intend to, you can just delete that and it will go away. And then I'll delete this as well. Okay, sorry. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Okay, and then all right. So I think I deleted everything. All right. So now I c I can save and continue. Actually, let me go back to that again. Um, there is a link here. So there is an error message or a pop-up message that comes up and it says, please update this section with your current loan information. The updated information must be consistent with your current billing statement and relevant loan documents. Okay, and it's, it's telling you that you need to upload that, uh, those specific documents in the supporting documents section. So there is a link here, instructions on how to complete this section if you, if you get confused whatsoever, we try our best to make this um, section as user-friendly as possible, but it's still confusing to people. So here is the step-by-step -step or kind of a, a more detailed information on how to fill out that form or that section. So again, you have access to that in your portal. Save and continue. This is the section where you're going to uh, to select your employer name, the site administrator, and the site. So for the purpose of this demo, I selected Arizona Department of Health Services, and now I'm going to um, select my site. So I'm going to select my name, so site admin. So if you don't know your site ad administrator's name, let's say you, you think of you know the site administrator, obviously your facility, but it's not in a drop-down menu. Just contact us and we can tell you because sometimes they assign a different point of contact for the site. So it may be, it may be different from, from the practice administrator that you know is, should be responsible for, it, for this uh, employment verification. If you don't see that name in the drop-down menu, contact us and we can tell you. So I'm going to select my name as the site administrator and I'm responsible for two sites. So I'm going to select site one. Okay, and then you have to add that site. Oh, something went wrong. Okay. It's already added. Oh, okay, so it's already added. Let me just, um, here, let me just delete these. And then I'm going to do it again, site one. Add site. All right, so now I've added my site and I'm going to be working at site one. So you can see here that there is an incomplete validation from the site admin. So this is the time when you see this and it still says pending. That means the site administrator has been verified. So an email notice uh, is sent out to the site administrator at site one and that site administrator is required to verify your employment at that site and also complete the additional verification process. So if you see this pending, that just means that your site administrator hasn't completed the verification process. However, even if that's the case, you can still continue with your application and it will give you this message and it says application final submission.
assistance can be per performed only after the site admin completes all the verification process. So again, like I mentioned earlier, uh, your site administrator has to complete the employment verification process in order for, for you to be able to submit your application. Okay, so if, if your site administrator did not complete this process and it's still pending, you are not able to, you're, you, you will not be able to move forward with submitting your application at all. So make sure you, uh, you, you follow up with your site administrators and make sure that, uh, let them know that they have to um, verify your employment as soon as possible so you, you can submit your application. So remember that the, the absolute deadline for submitting application is April 1st, certainly last year. We have had some issues with site administrators not verifying employment and therefore those providers were not able to, they, they have an initiated application, it's just a matter of them clicking the submit button, but they can't submit it because the employment, the employment verification is not being completed and therefore there are certain couple providers who were able to, who, who were not able to submit by the deadline and they missed basically that opportunity. So make sure um, the absolute deadline is April 1st to submit your renewal, renewal application, start your application early, follow up with your site administrator, make sure they complete that process as timely as possible and, there, and then you can submit your application. So this is the certification page and it's basically the same exact format as uh, what you saw before in the, in the um, paper application. It's basically asking you to certify that you meet all of the requirements of the program, which is very similar. It's the same exact language that you, that you um, saw previously in our paper-based application. So you have to check these boxes to, um, to certify that yes, you in fact still meet these requirements. And then there's certain authorizations that we're asking you to um, obviously read them and then um, consent for us to, re to release either your information uh, for, for us to be able to um, complete our, applica our application review. And then once you've initialed all of these boxes and checked all of the boxes on top, save and continue. Okay, so here you get a pop-up message saying you may upload all the required documents or reuse existing documents listed. So if you applied through the portal when you first submitted your application on, um, you know, two years ago, all of the documents that you've submitted through the portal should, should be here, but since you're, since this is the first time you're using your portal, there's not going to be any, you can't reuse any of the documents because we didn't have you submit your initial application um, through the portal last time. But these are the sections that you're going to navigate through in submitting your, your um, documentation. So the first section is the application certification page, which you, are see, you, you, you can see on the screen. And if you recall last time you submitted using the paper uh, application, there is a section where you're going to um, sign and notarize. This is this section. We cannot, um, this is something that they written in our policy and therefore we're still required to collect the notary. So in order for, for you to submit the notarized section, all you need to do is download the document for notarization by clicking this box, Initial Application Certification, Print for Signature and Notary. Once you click that, then you can open it and view the actual application. And once you view it, you'll see this is the exact same application that you filled out two years ago, except that now it's pre-filled with the information you just entered. So what you're going to do is print this document, and the final portion of this is this section where well, not, not this section, sorry, this section where it says notary required. So print this entire documentation, bring it to the notary, sign it, and then once it's uh, completed, then you scan it and, and upload it back in the system. In order to upload it, you just click on view documents, continue to upload. So obviously um, there are some um, files here that, that were that were uploaded previously. Um, so the next time you renew your contract with us and uh, renewing through the portal, you'll see all of the documents that you that you submitted um, the next time you apply. But for right now, when you when you go into the portal, obviously you're not going to see anything. So this is where you're going to click to upload your document. Um, so I'm going to try to upload something. Um, 
Right, webinar, webinar. This one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Go to USB drive. Go to renewal webinar. Okay, so you have to click save in order to save that file. And here it's telling that you have successfully uploaded one file. Hit OK. And then now you go to procurement. So you have to navigate through every single section of this upload section, basically. So all of these um, sections have specific documents that are required for you to submit. So here, when you click on procurement, you'll see um, that we identified all of the documents that you need to upload. So substitute W9 form for the purpose of your year three renewal, you're not gonna be required to submit this form unless there's been a change to your address. Um, and then your procurement portal um, registration confirmation, uh, you have to show or submit evidence that you've been registered or you're registered in the APP. So those are the two documents that you're going to upload in this section. So the bubbles that you see here opposite each section, um, it's it basically indicates the number of files that you've uploaded. So here in the procurement, um, there are two files that were uploaded. So if you view it, there are two files here. That's how you, you can tell um, that there were files uh, uploaded previously. But for, for, the, for, for the year three renewal for all of you, you'll see zero on here unless you upload a file. <clears throat> Personal information, again, this, these are the information we will collect again um, to capture them in the, in the electronic system, your birth certificate, social security card, current driver's license, and your current CV, license and educational certificates, um, your Arizona medical license, undergraduate, graduate, and if you did a postgraduate degree, um, also upload your diploma. A lot of people still ask us, why are we required to submit our degree, our undergraduate diploma? The reason, it's not, it's not because we're just wanting to see it, it's because it's in our policy. So even though, you know, it doesn't seem to make sense, like all of you obviously have a higher education, but for the purpose of the state loan payment program application, we are required to collect that information. So make sure that you upload your, your undergraduate diploma, your graduate, and again, postgraduate if applicable, your board certification or acceptance letter um, from the examining authority, and then your state or national certification. And then employment verification documents, this is again telling you what documents to be uploaded. You can either upload an, an executed employment contract that includes all of the things that I mentioned earlier, um, and just to emphasize, your, if you're qualifying as a full-time uh, participant, your employment contract has to state that you are working full-time at least 40 hours per week. If you're a half-time um, applicant, then your employment contract has to state you're a half-time employer, or I'm sorry, employment for at least 20 hours per week, your start date, and then the name and address of the service site. Um, if, you're, if you're submitting the employment letter, then all of those elements, again, have to be uh, included in the letter. If you are a provider working at multiple sites, the letter also has to state the estimated number of hours that you spend at each site. And the reason why is because we need to identify whether you're working at if you have a primary site that you, you are working at, and primary site is defined for the purpose of the state loan payment program as a site where you work at least 20 hours per week, which is half of your full-time hours. So if you're a half-time participant, then at least 50 hours of your time are spent at that facility in order for that site to be considered a primary site. And this is important because when we do the scoring, and if you have a primary site, the primary site score is taken into consideration. Um, for, the score, for scoring purposes. And if that primary site has the highest HIPSA score, then that high HIPSA score will be, will be used for the scoring purposes. Loan documents, again, it tells you all of the things that you need to upload as part of this section. Um, your most recent billing statement for each qualifying educational loan. So please make sure if you're reporting 
let's say three in, quali in the qualifying loan section that you have three billing statements um, uploaded here because what we're finding is that, you know, our providers, um, they think that they submitted something. Oh, yeah, I submitted, uh, you know, all of my recent billing statement, but in fact they didn't. So make sure that, you know, the billing statement corresponds to the, the, the loans that you reported on the qualifying loan section. Again, consolidated loans, we will ask for an updated or itemized breakdown of the consolidated loan. So if you just recently consolidated your loans and it's not captured in our amendment, um, in, the, in any of the state loan repayment program amendments, um, make sure that the consolidation um, documents are uploaded on here as well. Um, it, that's the easiest um, thing that we can look at to make sure that what you've Sometimes, you, you know, if you consolidated uh, your loans that we approved previously, so let's say, you know, you, uh, you were approved for um, Fed loans and now been, and then you consolidated them uh, into one, we, we just want to see that those are the exact same loans that you consolidated. So please submit your documentation or your consolidation documents. And then additional documents, as I mentioned earlier, only if you're wanting to qualify for extra points, evidence of residency is what you're going to score, to be scored at for this particular um, renewal. So make sure that uh, you have a, a, the, the necessary documentation uh, to show proof that you have been residing in Arizona physically for at least 12 months. And if you click on that question mark, um, icon, you'll see all of the different uh, documents that you can submit. It's, it's a combination of these different documents. So if you think that your driver's license already show that you've been in Arizona for that long, then that would be good enough. But if not, then you can, of course, um, submit more than one document to show that. Okay, continue. I'm oh, sorry. Yep, continue, and then here it says you will not be able to proceed past the point until after the site admin completes the verification. So again, because the site administrator has not completed the verification process, you cannot get to the checklist verification page, which is the last section before you submit your application. But I have a print screen of that that I can show you. All right, so if, you're, um, if your site admin verifies your employment completed that process already, then this is the next screen. This is the final screen that you'll see, which is the checklist verification. On top, it basically tells you that the red asterisk items are required for all participants, and then the yellow asterisk items you have to choose or, or, or um, check one of them. And then the green asterisk items are those that are only, if applicable, you'll need to submit, okay? So this last section is designed for, to help our, our applicants to ensure that their application is as complete as possible. So here you have to check the boxes um, to make sure that you've actually, in fact, uploaded all of these documents. So the red items, you, you absolutely need to check them because they are required. If you don't check these boxes, then you can't move forward. So for the purpose of the renewal, and if you're not submitting the substitute W-9 form, which is only if you, you have a change in address, obviously you're not, not going to submit substitute W-9 for th this time, but for the purpose of the re going through this process, just check that to override the system. And then you have to go through that list. Oh, sorry. And then the yellow item, again, either or. So you have to check at least one of the yellow asterisk item if you're trying to, well, you can, of course, check both of them if you're providing both the employment contract and employment letter. Um, but if you only have one, let's say you only have the employment contract, then check the employment contract, and then all of the different, the, the, the required items underneath, um, underneath um, that, uh, what they call this, that item. So, so make sure that your employment contract has a full-time employment for at least 40 hours or 20 hours a week, employment start date, name, and address of the service site. If you're submitting an employment letter in lieu of the contract, then you check that. 
employment letter is what, I'm sorry, what you're submitting and then all of the boxes underneath that item. And then most recent billing statement, and then if applicable for consolidated loans, the itemized breakdown of the consolidated loans, and then documentation from the lender that the loans were used solely for education. So once you've gone through this list and you basically kind of confirm that, yes, I checked, I, I uploaded this, 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 and this, and you've gone through all of these things that are required and, um, you know, if applicable um, items, then you can hit the submit button. And once you submit, you hit the submit button, there's a pop-up message um, that will indicate that you have successfully submitted your application. So if you didn't see that pop-up message, confirm with us that we actually have it in our queue because this happened last year where the pop-up message did not come up and it could be just a glitch in our system. So if it didn't come up and you don't have an indication of whether you, your, your application has actually been submitted or not, just confirm with us and we can tell you. Once you hit submit, it will tell you that you will be navigated to the home page, which is the landing page. And that's it, you're, you're done. And, and uh, when you get to the landing page, then you'll see the completed application at the bottom of that screen um, that I covered earlier. So that is it for the step-by-step. -step. For customer support, if you get stuck, Ashley and I are available, my phone number and Ashley's phone number as well as our email addresses are provided here. Our team, I just want to thank everyone for um, really, our electronic system has been in existence just for a year and we've had a lot of successes in u implementing the system. Our goal is to enhance customer experience. Hopefully, uh, this is going to be an easier, um, uh, friendly, user-friendly interface for, for all of you um, and a better experience than, than submitting a paper application. And I've just uh, finished with the live demo. I want to thank you all for participating, and we will open it up for questions. Okay, so for anyone who has questions, please use the chat box on the right-hand screen. Um, like I had mentioned earlier at the beginning of this uh, webinar, we will be um, emailing everyone the PowerPoints as well as the recorded webinar. We're also going to be posting it on our website. Like, I just want everyone to remember that we will be sending out the renewal codes hopefully mid-February. Like Anna had mentioned earlier, please let us know if you don't get that specific code for renewal and we can provide that to you. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat cube. Um, like Anna mentioned, we are available via uh, email and phone call, preferably via email. Can we start uploading? Okay, so we did get a question, can we start uploading information now? No, the answer is no, because we have sites currently registering um, until February 28th. The application cycle does not open until March 1st of 2019, so you won't be able to start um, doing your application until then. Any other questions? We will be sending out an, a reminder email to everyone, letting them know when the application cycle opens for renewing candidates. Uh, this will also be, hopefully, we'll, well, well, we're not going to post it on our website. We'll just send it by email. So watch out for those email, but you can all, always uh, call us at any time and we can confirm. Uh, there shouldn't be any change in the date that the application um, uh, period will open for renewing candidates. Again, it's March 1st to April 1st is when you can renew your contract. So on March 1, you can access the portal, you can initiate your application, you can submit all the supporting documents or upload your supporting documents. But again, if your site administrators um, have not completed the verification process, you can, you can have your application penned in the system until such time that your employment verifications have been completed to where you can submit the application uh, completely in the portal. We have another question in the loan section where we enter the loan numbers. If I consolidate it, do I have to enter each one or do I enter the one consolidated loan with the total amount? If you consolidated your loan, say um, now it's uh, handled through Mohila, for example, and um, what you're going to enter as a loan servicer is Mohila and under the loan details, 
all you need to enter is the consolidate is the loan that you consolidated. So if the Mohila account now uh, covers the Fed loan, and even though there are different loans within Fed loan, you don't have to enter those loan details. Um, all you need to enter is the Fed loan account that you had consolidated with Mohila. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you, Gina, for confirming. Um, if there's no other, um, if there are any other questions, I remind you that you can use the chat box. Um, any other questions that you may have that you think of later on, you can always call or email us. Um, you will be receiving an email shortly from us with the webinar information as well as PowerPoint to help you and be used as a resource. But thank you everyone for attending. Um, we know that this took a chunk out of your day. Um, but thank you again and we hope you have a good rest of your day.